Kathleen Aguero comes from Cambridge area, and she is a poet who first began writing poems as a child, as soon as she could write. Uh, she had tried drawing, and, but the objects weren't quite what she had in mind to uh, symbolize what her thoughts. And when she came to words, shortly after she took to writing poems and found herself fascinated by language, since then, she has published five books of poetry, with the latest titled after that, published by Tiger Bark Books. She's also been involved in editing and co-editing, and she's uh, been a part of the co-editing for three volumes of multicultural literature for the University of Georgia Press, and she is consulting editor for the Solstice Literary Magazine. Kathleen also teaches low residency MFA program for creative writing at Pine Manor College. And she also works in the Changing Lives program through literature, which is an alternative sentencing program for criminal offenders on probation, where they are presented with uh, classics and literature and different types of literary readings. And with Kathleen, they also have opportunity to read and write poetry. And Kathleen noted, poetry is powerful for the students here because it reaches them emotionally, intellectually, and musically. They understand it instinctively. And when I asked her for a most memorable, memorable moment or two in her own writing and teaching, uh, Kathleen noted in her work with vet veterans that they wrote so, of, from such a brave place and they were so imaginative and that she's also worked with those um, who are in the schools, the much younger ages, in the Poets in the Schools program, and found that kids are literary geniuses. Their imaginations haven't been tamped down. And so uh, Kathleen has her own poetry, and she has inspired many other people to find the poetry within them. Uh, throughout community. And here today to share some of her own words is Kathleen Aguero. Please give her a warm welcome up here. I'd like to begin reading uh, two poems from Daughter Of, which was published in 2009. And a lot of the poems in this book are based on myth. I was teaching a course in mythology and literature at the time and <clears throat> became very interested in, in the way reimagining myths or, or placing them in a contemporary setting or simply finding their relevance to our lives um, and trying to do that through poetry. So the first poem is called Persephone Returned. One by one, the things I'd brought from home all disappeared. My pastel dresses, too ingenue, he said, and bought me more in slinky black and silver. My teenage charm bracelet, sentimental, replaced with heavy sapphire, jet. He dressed me, chose my makeup, did my hair. But when he took my locket, not that, I said. He laughed. His look was steel against my throat. One step toward me, and I understood. I had no friends. The second time, he grabbed my upper arm and left a mark. In spring, when I'm let home to visit, daisies blooming everywhere. My mother's overjoyed to see me. <coughs> we roam the fields, our arms around each other's waists, the way we used to do. I like to see the roses in your cheeks again, she says. I catch her covert glance. She doesn't like the bruised look of my eyes, my hollowed face. She offers apricots the color of sunset, tomatoes bursting with juice, oranges, berries, my favorites. I rarely get fresh fruit, I say. She doesn't answer. At the end of summer, he sends for me a sleek black limousine, a diamond brooch to match my tears. You, you don't want for a thing, my mother always says, looking at these gifts, then pointing to the fields already parched, the rest unspoken. Each time, despite myself, she has to peel my arms from off her shoulders. Every woman knows some hardship. She hands me over to my husband's driver. 
Of course I was flattered when he noticed me a local girl. He was urbane, handsome, wealthier than any man I'd met. I mistook his appraisal for praise. One moment I was fainting in his arms, the next packed up beside him in that car, my mother waving from the yard, my father in the parlor toasting himself with champagne. The rooms in this vast house are dark and quiet. Men sipping fine brandy, sleek women trailing perfumed scarves drift in and out. The house is strangely empty in the day. He sleeps, one heavy leg across mine. When I stir to see the morning sun, don't go, he says, and it is not a plea. We understand each other now, he murmurs, his large hand in the hollow of my back as he steers me through the room greeting guests at smoky parties. I see myself from far away. Those aren't what you want, he says tonight when I choose common daisies for my hair. I let them drop, the sharp heels of my shoes crushing them, my own body cold to my touch, my face a still life in the mirror. I think most people are familiar with Medusa, the woman with the snaky hair, and you looked at her, you turned into stone. But um, when I was teaching and reading about her, it turns out she wasn't always a Gorgon. She was once a beautiful young woman. And the poem tells the story of what happened to her. Medusa. She surfaced from Poseidon's rape alone, but for Athena plating snakes into her hair. Who wouldn't want a face that turns a man to stone? The most beautiful of three sisters turned Gorgon, yet feeling human pain there in the temple where she fought alone. Out of pride, Perseus brought her snakehead home, wedding present for an exiled mother who, in despair, needed a face to turn her consort into stone. Think how the Trojan women moaned, resisted being herded onto nightmare ships ravaged by Greeks, not alone, their children watching, plotting to be grown to warriors or stunned by terror of what they'd share unless they found a face to turn men into stone. Think of any woman caught in war, in mundane violence, atoning for her body's flesh and bone, praying only she might wake alone. Why wouldn't she want a face to turn man into stone? My most recent book is After That, um, published by Tiger Bark Press. And several of the poems, it has different sections, different kinds of poems in it, but several of the poems have to do with my mother's Alzheimer's um, and her decline. And so I'll start out with a few of those poems. Where do you live? Do you have any children? This is my mother speaking to me in a room where her grandchildren's photos cover the walls. You look tall, she says, and your hair is so curly, you still don't comb it. I know who you are. I just wasn't expecting someone so young. <laughs> Leftovers. When she chews the napkin, mistaking it for an hors d'oeuvre, when she eats the tea bag that rests by the side of her cup, I want to be the one to gently take the plate away to give her something tastier for lunch. The general, we called her. When she told us what time we'd leave for the beach, challenged the nuns who bullied her children, sold the house, packed the furniture, chose the paint for new walls, drove a rental car through the mountains of France. No, Ruthie, put this end to your ear, I hear my father tell her when I phone to say flights are canceled because of snow and I won't be home for Christmas. It's a good thing you can't come, she tells me. It's terrible here. I've never seen anything like it. Inside our house, strangers are, are walking around in their coats. That night, after dinner, my father will hand my mother plastic plates to dry as he wraps up the leftovers, puts the carving knife in its case. Over and over, she'll wipe the same dish. Prayer for my mother. May the warm breeze lift the hem of her nightgown, though she no longer knows what a nightgown is for. 
Let hummingbirds hover at the feeder her husband hung on the rail, butterflies to the Budalea. Let her study the clouds where spa while sparrows deliver her worries one by one to the sky. May she finally stop stirring the murk of her mind. Let her tea have some flavor. This next poem um, isn't based just on my mother. I had several, a friend of mine also uh, suffered a severe depression. And when things like this happen, you kind of wonder where do the people you know go? and what constitutes ourselves that we think of as so sturdy um, and that they can change so dra drastically. So I was sort of trying to explore that in this poem. After that, she wouldn't leave the house or she'd be gone for weeks and return smelling of cigarettes and bleach. She'd say what anyone would, but like thunder in winter, it didn't sound quite right. When she thought we weren't looking, she tied knots in her hair. She wouldn't eat anything white, hid money in the refrigerator, wore five pairs of underpants at once, cringed at butterflies. She covered her ears when she talked and was afraid of the telephone. She threw away her plants, collected fruit pits. She stopped biting her fingernails after that, but she wouldn't let anyone cut them either. She wore a hat, but never a jacket. Her dogs wouldn't go near her. She wouldn't answer the doorbell, but she never closed the door. She refused to go near the windows. After that, she never drank tea. She hissed at her dead mother standing in the doorway. She ripped her good dress into pieces and cut her father's photograph in half. We didn't know how to think about her after that. One thing I noticed um, with friends, particularly, people seem to have a kind of timetable for getting over grief. You know, you go through the stages, whatever they are, and in a year it should be over with, but we all know it doesn't work like that. And so I found myself getting impatient with that attitude. Racing for grief. Leaving the swamp of new grief behind where professional mourners cheered us, come on, you can do it. I enter the flatlands of denial. A third of the pack reaches the thundering mountain of rage. Already I can hear the front runners bellow. Not even spelunking the dank caves of sorrow has prepared me for the sheer face of anger. Someone screams, let it all out, stabbing an effigy with sharp scissors. My blisters hurt. There's a hole in my pants, my face covered with soot. Where are the oranges and water, they promised. Surely the next stage will be easy. But, as usual, I get lost in the maze of guilt, walking round and around until someone takes pity and points out the exit. Even then, I'm slow to leave. Although there, on the summit of acceptance, the victors, laurel wreaths on their heads, uncork champagne, spread red checkered claws on soft grass. Will I be the one to lie? I'm just glad I finished. Keep it up, almost there, they chant from the heavens, clapping me on. I'm picking up speed when the first stage of stubbornness kicks in. And like Ferdinand the bull over there sniffing flowers, I sit down right here in the meadows of longing, and I take my sweet time. I was teaching um, a writing workshop for adults at Chautauqua in New York, and we used Neruda's book of questions. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a wonderful book in which he asks very strange questions. He provides no answers. Um, so I had the students make up their own whimsical questions, but they had to swap and write answers. And from that exercise, which I also did, I, I drew a series of poems about objects with which you fasten your clothing. So I'd like to read a few of those from this series called Fastenings. Each time the buttonhole opens its mouth, a backdoor history escapes. Stop, it says. Hide, it says. I'll hold you. Tidy, whip stitch, and I was wedded to mother of pearl. I wake, then I sleep. 
I wake, then I sleep, chants the buttonhole. We also serve who hold things together, who cover them up. I've got your back, the buttonhole says. I've got your front, in one hole and out the other. Oh, moon, oh, wafer, the buttonhole moans. Insert coin here. Here I come, cries the zipper, crossing the continent of your jacket, climbing up to your waistband, easing you out of those tight pants. Don't play up, down, up, down with me and stop fumbling. My lips are sealed, but I have teeth. I bite, I break, I grab your coat and don't let go. I love to get close to myself. Don't derail me. Needle without thread, point without purpose. Thread without needle, back with no bone. What is more unlike the one that pierces than the one that binds? Yet needles an open yawn without thread, an exclamation never uttering its cry. And thread, wound tight or lying tangled in a basket, what matter its color, its texture, its weight? A little spit on one end, a little poke through needle's eye. Watch them, sharp and gentle, puncture and pull, miniature, gra- sorry, miniature dashes graphing their wake. When needle sleeps, it longs for thread's arrival. Also included in this book um, are a series of poems that were published in a chapbook. And they're poems about Nancy Drew, who was a great idol of mine when I was a child. And then when I got older, I thought, well, now I really need her. Where is she? And I began to imagine what it would be like if she herself ever aged. So Nancy Drew fans will will realize that this first poem is practically a found poem um, based on the titles of her mysteries. Mystery of the Girl Sleuth, for Nancy Drew on her 50th birthday. What secret does the old clock hold now? Where does the hidden staircase lead? It's time to mount the 99 steps, accept the secret in the attic. The clues have been there all along in your diary, in the old album, in the velvet mask you struggle to remove. Answer the invitation to the Golden Pavilion. Read the mysterious letter of your own blood. Lean against the crumbling wall and listen to the mystery of the tolling bell. Although you wish you'd never started on this quest for the missing map, you must follow it to the message in the hollow oak across the haunted bridge to face the wooden lady and the statue whispering what you do not want to hear. Those of you who are Nancy Drew uh, fans remember that she could do anything. She, you know, changed a tire in her roadster. She, you know, wrestled with with criminals. She could do anything. Um, And for people who are competent, that competence exacts a price, exacts a toll. Her competence. Nancy's sick of being competent, but can't quit because someone else made her up and she still earns them money. (laughs) A hundred crime victims whimper like strays in a pound. Mystery after mystery she can solve in white gloves and a hat. That one sold well, so they write her into another. Just about now, she'd like to change plots, but she can't figure out how to trade in her roadster for a bucking bronco or a truck with a rifle underneath the front seat. She'd like to strip off her clothes as slowly as daybreak in winter and tease some crook into her bed. She has transferable skills, but doesn't know how to describe them. Sometimes she thinks she'd rather serve coffee in the local diner slap a wet rag across tables so it smudges more than it wipes off. She'd listen to people's troubles without having to solve them. Maybe things would be different in a bigger city, Paris or Rio, or in a place so remote only she ate the vegetables grown there. Or just once, could she be the one to get rescued? Now, 
Nancy Drew didn't have a mother. Her father was a widower. He was a lawyer, Carson Drew. And um, he was a remarkable father. He'd help, let her help solve his cases. And then as soon as he things got tough and she got tied up in a basement, he'd be gone on a business trip. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he'd come back. Things would be fine. The father we all want. Her perfect dad. I'm Carson Drew. I disappear. Don't interfere in court all day. I won't take pages to explain. I've got no wife, a discreet sex life, reasonable, manageable. Any danger, all adventure, I approve. Every girl wants a dad like me. I buy the car. She drives. <laughs> If you, when, well, rereading re the, the Nancy Drew books was kind of startling because there's an awful lot of ethnic and class bias that was not apparent to me as a child. All the criminals are swarthy, that's the term they use, <laughs> and all the victims tend to be impoverished gentility. <laughs> Unsolved. Who sewed her frocks, repaired that car, washed dishes at the club? Who put the dessert fork where the knife was supposed to go? Who swept her tennis courts at the end of the day? We have to blink our eyes, refocus foreground, background to solve these mysteries hidden in the pages of the others, like a thumbprint concealed in a scroll of tree bark. Look, we were just outside her line of vision all the time. Our blistered, our blistered hands poking out behind a flower pot. One calloused foot wedged between the pickets of a white fence. Who never got invited to the tea dance? Who didn't know what a tea dance was? Whose absence went unnoticed at the lake? I certainly had no idea, and still am quite, not quite sure what a tea dance is, um, but never troubled me as a child. <laughs> and I'd like to end with this poem. Zen Nancy. The roadster's on blocks. She walks most everywhere or takes the bus. What curiosity she feels is inner, quiet. The mysteries she solved, so innocent, they hardly seem crimes at all. She laughs at her logical mind. She was an icon for a certain type, but that girl was so young, and Nancy's losing more difficult cases these days. The code of the aurora borealis, the sound of stone, the color of air, the vast and clueless sky. Thank you very much. Just a man and a piano, not a volcano or even a team of horses, but sitting so near, only 10 feet away, I know joy tinged with alarm, as if the puzzle could explode, send out sparks or sharp hooves. Unready, captured forward, watching his hands I feel the music in my hands, the work of two thrown together, chasing, overtaking, then falling against each other to rest between variations. One brother sets out on a boat, on a choppy sea. One is anchor. Two sisters sing, trading the melody. Question after question after question. And remember? A long married, lost and found couple listen together. Thank you. Fish. Listen, there was a time when I fished for sport. I'd catch a dozen perch, peeling the skin off in a single piece. I loved the mossy smell, the emery rough scales. But I can't catch fish anymore. 
ever since Andy's whistling line reeled in that leaping black bass scooped into my net. It was scarred about the lips, that fish, scales missing on its flank, tournament size, gasping. Eat it later, we agreed. We kept it all al alive overnight, and at dawn, over dewy grass, I stepped up to the tank. See, the bass stirred. It tipped its eye at me. I carried the creature to the water's verge, floated it on my palms until it tipped itself into the flow. A few days later, Harold pulled up in his aluminum boat with three rods, minnow pail, fish box, lunch. He hauled his fatigues onto our dock and up the hill, puffing a bit. From a frothy beer out bubbled his stories of pike fishing, duck shoots. He was hunting old river photographs, to give to the museum. Did we have any? You know, Harold often fishes off our point. I shared with him our tale of Andy's catch, the large battered bass with the scratched up mouth. Harold gazed out the window. I know that bass, I've caught him myself. <laughs> Thank you. Running late, I take the wrong exit, and my grandson laughs. He hasn't yet learned how to panic. Lavender, jasmine, rosemary